Okay. Yeah. So it's my pleasure once again to uh, to have uh, Junla um, in this uh, program to give us a lecture on um, recursion theory and uh, the Diophantine, um, I know, the, the Hilbert's 10th problem. So uh, without further ado, um, Junla, go ahead. Uh, thanks to you all for the introduction and uh, well, welcome back. If, uh, I'm glad you're here. Let me just start by, I forgot to share this in the chat again. So I've put the latest versions of the slides uh, online. So if you want to follow along, there might be a good source, like say if I'm ahead and you wanted to look at the previous slide. Now, let me give a quick recap of what we talked about last time. Last time we introduced this, well, we introduced Hilbert's 10th problem and a key notion in the study of Hilbert's 10th problem is the notion of Delphantine relation. So let me start by reminding you what that is because we'll uh, dive deep into what this is really like today. So a relation S of uh, these are on the natural numbers. It's a Diophantine relation. If there is some Diophantine equation P, so remember a Diophantine equation is one which has uh, integer coefficients. Okay, so like a polynomial with integer coefficients, uh, such that this uh, some tuple is an element of S, so is in the relation, if and only if there are some y's such that this uh, polynomial is equals to zero. So you know, roughly speaking, we're saying, okay, um, this we want this polynomial to have a solution, right? But this is really, it's not like a single polynomial because it's really a family of polynomials, which uh, is parametrized by the axis. Okay, and that's this, it's this family which is defining this uh, S. And uh, last thing we also talked about some examples since they're on the slide here, let me just quickly show you. So remember that we can talk about, oh, if X divides Y, well, we can specify that by saying, okay, is there a D such that Y is equals to DX, right? So that's a very simple Delphantine definition. Uh, another one is like, okay, if X is less than Z, uh, then we can say, well, that's true. If and only if there is some V so that X plus V plus one minus Z equals to zero. Uh, remember that the scope of these quantifiers, this existential quantifiers is always the natural numbers. That's a, a convention that we'll stick to. Okay, so that's kind of a, a recap of the main definition that we talked about last time. Uh, then we went on to prove some properties of uh, Delphantine relations. We showed that they are closed under intersection and union. We talked about Delphantine functions, which are functions whose graph is a Delphantine relation. And we started looking at closure properties of Delphantine functions. So we showed, for example, that they are closed under composition. And now that brings us to the statement of the main theorem that I'm going to prove today. At least I'm going to sketch the proof of it. Uh, and this is the following. This, uh, the Delphantine functions are exactly the recursive functions. Okay, in other words, a function on the natural numbers is Delphantine if and only if it is recursive. And this notion of recursive is something that uh, was defined in Patrick's lectures previously. Uh, it is something from recursion theory. So the nice thing here is that, you know, something that's purely number theoretic happens to agree with something that's sort of purely recursion theoretic. Now, I forget if I talked about one direction last time, but uh, let me just say it again, if I did. Uh, one direction of this theorem is quite easy, okay? So it's easy to, to see that every Delphantine relation is recursive. Let's talk about why. So suppose we have a Delphantine function. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, that means that if you want to specify whether z is equals to f of x, there is some uh, polynomial p uh, which defines it. So there exists a y, I mean, z is, in, z is equals to f of x if and only if there exists some y such that p x z y is zero. Okay, so that's just the definition of what it means to be a Diophantine function. Now, uh, why is this recursive? Well, the basic point is that for each X and Z, okay, we can do an unbounded search for some Y 
which makes p of x z y equals to zero. Okay, and the way we do it is like literally by brute force, right? We start from the smallest possible y. Okay, and so we fix some order on all of the tuples of y's. Okay, and then we start from the first one, and then we check. Okay, is this a solution? Um, maybe it is. If it is, then we're done, right? Because we have managed to find uh, some some solution. Uh, otherwise, we just keep going. Okay, and so we do this at the same time for every x and every z. And eventually, no, sorry, no, not, not for every x and every z, but just uh, for every x. No, for every z, sorry, <laughs> for every z and not for every x because x is fixed. Okay, so x is given to us. We want to find f of x, right, which is the z. So for each z in parallel, we're doing this unbounded search. And eventually, um, there is exactly one z for which we will find such a y bar. So this is going to happen in finite time. And uh, so it's a computable process. So that's kind of a, an intuitive argument for why uh, this is a recursive function. Formally speaking, you would have to talk about minimization and things like that, you know, things which are part of the definition of being recursive. Uh, but it, yeah, this is a, it's a sketch. So uh, this direction is the easy direction of the theorem. The other direction is going to take us all of today. So the next uh, two hours, essentially. Um, and it will be, I will say, it is very number theoretic. So there will be a lot of things which are you know, not considered part of logic at all. It's kind of purely number theory. Um, but you know, I, I, hope, I hope it's still interesting to you either way. Before we move on, are there any questions of, about this slide? Or just any questions about stuff that we talked before, uh, like basic notions that um, you're curious about. No, sounds good to me. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the feedback to you. All. <laughs> so yeah, if you have any uh, questions anytime, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can put it in chat. All right. So now the the other direction. Uh, this is a this is a huge proof. So. I need to kind of break it down into pieces. We'll reduce it many times into easier things. Uh, as, a, as a preliminary step, okay, so I'm, I'm going to build up one of the tools that we need in the future. As a preliminary step, uh, recall that the recursive functions are closed under primitive recursion. All right, that's part of the definition of being a recursive function. It's the, the, re the class of recursive functions is the smallest class of functions which uh, contain certain things and are closed under certain operations. One of these operations is primitive recursion. Uh, let me remind you what primitive recursion is. So I'm kind of reminding you in this following form. Uh, if we want to show that the, every Diophantine function, no, if, if we want to show that every recursive function is Diophantine, okay, then it had better be the case that the Diophantine functions are also closed under primitive recursion. Right, because the ultimate goal is to show that these are the same class of functions. So they should have the same closure properties. So let's write out what it means to, for the Diophantine functions to be closed under primitive recursion. I have it here. So what we have is first we have some function f. Okay, f is a function on natural numbers. It takes in n natural numbers and produces one natural number. We also have a function g. It takes in n plus two natural numbers and it outputs one natural number. If we have functions f and g like this, okay, uh, which are delta nt, then uh, we demand, we want to show that the a function h, which is defined from f and g using primitive recursion, is also delta nt. So what is h? Well, first of all, h takes in n plus one numbers. And it's defined as follows. So if the second coordinate, uh, no, if the last coordinate is zero, then H is just copying F, okay? So think of F as like the base case in some kind of uh, iteration. F is giving us the base case. And then to kind of do the, to, to get like stuff that is not the base case, we apply G, okay? So for example, 
over here, if you look at this, if we take t to be zero in the second line, then we are saying that h of x one is equals to g of x t. And over here in the last part, we should have h of x zero. And h of x zero, which is already determined from before, it's f of x. So h of x one, again, is roughly speaking the composition of g and f. Uh, if we think about what's h of x two now, then we are taking kind of the composition of g and g and f or something like that. So, so imagine we're starting from f and then we repeat, repeatedly apply g. That's roughly speaking the idea behind uh, primitive recursion. Okay, so this is uh, gonna be a, a, a goal that we have. And now I'm gonna talk about some tools that uh, will be used to eventually achieve this goal. All right, so here's the goal. I've just repeated this from the last slide uh, because it's a, it's a mouthful. So hopefully this will give you more time to read it. Now, uh, this, this presents a, a technical challenge. And, and one of the kind of the big first issues that we need to address is, well, okay, how do we define such an H? in a Diophantine way. Well, somehow, like how do we know that a number is equals to h of x t, okay? Well, the only way we know that something is h of x t is essentially only, we have to figure out what is h of x t minus one, right? Because that is part of the definition of h It's built up in this recursive way. So figuring out whether something is h of x t well, it kind of depends on, you know, it, it relies on knowing what is h of x t minus one. Uh, but that keeps going, right? So now in order to figure out whether something is h of x t minus one, we need to know what is h of x t minus two and so on. So dot, 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 right? If you keep going, eventually you hit zero. So what, that, what this kind of reasoning suggests is that we need to be able to look at the, we need to be able to define the entire history of a computation. Okay, so again, if you think of primitive recursion as like, okay, we start with some base case and then we keep iterating. Uh, the point here is that in order to figure out the result of the iteration, we need to figure out the entire history of the iteration, like what happened at each step. And this history is what I've written out here, right? So at the first step, we have h of x zero. That's the sort of base case. Right. And then as you keep applying G, right, then you, you apply G once, you get H of X one, you apply G twice, you get H of X two, and you eventually apply it uh, T many times and get to H of X T. Okay, so that's the, that's the first kind of, um, kind of observation about this, this endeavor is that if we want to figure out what H of X T is, we need to figure out more things actually we want to look at the entire history now that that presents an issue because t is a variable here okay and and what do i mean by you know why is this an issue let's think about okay what if t were actually fixed okay then this task uh, would actually be very easy uh, and here i've just written out an example for fixed t, okay, let's say t equals to two, uh, we could easily do this, right? This, this is um, very trivial, right? So to define whether y is equals to h of x two, we can write the following definition. We say, well, there is some y zero and y one, uh, so that y zero is equals to f of x. So that's the base case now. And y one is equals to g, apply to y zero, okay? So th this is kind of the intermediate step. And then the final piece now, the kind of the second step of the iteration, we wanna say that y is the result of applying g to y one, okay? So this definition here is basically, what we're doing is we are kind of hard coding the, like hard coding the history into the, 
into the definition in some sense. We are saying that, oh, okay, we know that this iteration is gonna take two steps, right? So we can just say like, okay, there is some y0 and y1, which are the intermediate steps. And uh, we can handle that using the Diophantine definitions. The issue now is that this is not enough, right? Because we need a single definition, in other words, a single polynomial equation that works for every t. What I've showed you here is a definition that works only for t equals to two. If we were to do larger and larger t, well, then the equation is gonna go longer and longer, right? There's gonna be more, more variables, uh, more existential quantifiers and so on. So that's not, not a legal way to define it, right? Because we need a single formula. Um, that works for all t. The, the, the kind of remedy to this is that we need to encode the history as a single number. So right here, right? So looking back to the history and in the middle of the slide, the history for hxt, right, is like a sequence of t plus one many numbers, right? And what we're doing essentially in this example below for the t equals to two is that we are adding a new existential quantifier for every entry in the history. Okay, we're adding a new variable and we're adding a new existential quantifier for this variable. And as I just said, we, we shouldn't actually do that because that's gonna give us like, you know, essentially, uh, like arbitrarily long formulas, which is bad. So what we'll do is that we'll instead find some way to encode this entire history, you know, this sequence of t plus one many numbers into a single number. And then we can use a single existential quantifier over that number in order to define uh, this, uh, the function h. That means, in order to encode a sequence as a number, that means that we need to uh, define some kind of uh, encoding that allows us to do it. Okay, and this is a, um, well, it's a, it's a very common thing that we want to do in, in logic to be able to encode a sequence as a number, you know, that's a very important thing to have if we want to do anything uh, non-trivial. Okay, so this slide um, maybe sounds uh, pretty vague, um, but that's okay. Uh, I think basically the takeaway from this slide is that if we want to be able to show that uh, the Delphantine functions are closed under primitive recursion, we want to be able to encode sequences of numbers as a single number in a Delphantine way. So that's what we're going to work towards. Uh, on the next slide. Any, any questions before I proceed? I'm sorry, the space key was supposed to work. I guess it didn't. Oh, yeah. uh, there are uh, bijections between uh, like the natural numbers and uh, pairs, triplets, et cetera. Uh, can those be used to uh, um, to iterate over higher dimensions, number parameters? Yeah, so that's a that's a great point. And indeed, on the next slide, we will use a pairing function uh, to 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 do that. But uh, notice that that only works for a fixed number of uh, like sequences of a fixed length, right? A pairing function works for just two numbers, it, and it you know makes it into one. Uh, and if for any fixed number, we can have like a, a tupling function. But if you want to have a function that works for sequences of arbitrary length, then that's going to require uh, more finesse. But so, you, you have a fixed number for each specific function, right? And you know that there is a function for any specific length. So I'm not sure where the problem actually lies. Okay, so the, the problem is that, so for each t, okay, we have a function that takes like the t, 
uh, you know, t, a sequence of t elements and maps it to a single number, okay? However, we need a single function that works for every t, and that single function has to be delta and t. Well, if can't you uh, use recursion on a single function? The number. Well, <laughs> so, so you could use recursion, but the whole point here is that we don't know that recursion is delta and t. That is exactly the main theorem. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, right, right. So that's a great point, but yeah, we don't know that. So <laughs> that's all we're trying to prove. Yeah. Right. Uh, Tuyao, did you want to say something? Yeah. Can I just guess uh, what it is like? Is it, <laughs> is it a Chinese remainder theorem? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that will be coming up soon. Yeah. Cool. Great. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Uh, now let's talk about, so, okay, first let's talk about this pairing function thing, right? So that's kind of a, a basic step that you want to do. Uh, so this is uh, what we want to show. So this is a uh, theorem about showing that we can do pairing. And formally speaking, what we're saying is that, okay, there are three Diophanty functions, P, L, and R. So P stands for pair, L stands for left, and R stands for right. The idea is given numbers x and y, p of x, y is going to output the code for the pair x, y. And given a code for a pair, l of that code is going to give us the left, the first component of the pair. And similarly, r of the code of a pair is going to give us the right component or second component of the pair. So formally speaking, right, this, these are expressed in the properties uh, one and two, right? We're saying that, okay, for all X and Y, if you take the L of the P of X, Y, then it should give you X. Similarly, if you take the R of the P of X, Y, that should give you Y. And number two here says that for all Z, well, if you take, so Z here, think of Z as the code of a pair, then if you take L of Z and you take R of Z, so you kind of project to the first component and then you project to the second component and then you join them back again, that's just going to give you Z again. So these are all like, you know, very reasonable properties that we want a pairing function to have. And uh, number three here, uh, it's not so clear why we want such a thing right now, but essentially it says that this uh, pairing function is kind of well-behaved. Like um, what the inequality says is that the code of a pair is always uh, greater or equals to its individual components. And so this is good uh, because it well basically it allows us to, if you look at a code for a pair, you can kind of do like a, a bounded search uh, for what should be its left component or what is its right component. Okay, it's it's not, what I just said is not quite correct, but basically just think of point number three as like something nice that uh, that is useful sometimes in, uh, in technical uh, situations. Okay, so what is this function uh, that, I'm, uh, that I'm claiming that, uh, that they exist? Well, we can use the usual Cantor pairing function. So this is uh, how it looks like. Uh, we take x comma y, okay? And then we send into this number. Okay, which is basically uh, x plus y plus one choose two uh, plus y. Yeah. And so I'm gonna take this guy here to be my function capital P. Now, um, I, I hope you believe that uh, this is a Daufantin definition, right? This is like all I've done here is like polynomial stuff. Uh, but I also need to tell you how to extract uh, the first component and second component, right? Given this expression, how do I extract uh, X and Y? So uh, let me show you the Daufantin definitions involved here. Okay, so formally speaking, these are the Daufantin definitions. The first one, uh, Z is equals to PXY if uh, 2Z is equals to X plus Y plus X plus Y, X plus Y times X plus Y plus one plus two Y. Okay, so this is just a, a rephrasing of z equals to this uh, expression here. 
So that's style of 19, right? In fact, there's not even any quantifiers here. So it's very nice. Now X is equals to L of Z. Well, if there is some Y such that this uh, same equation holds. And similarly, X is equals to R of Z if uh, there exists X such that this same equation holds. So we can check you know, that there is some uh, algebra to do, uh, but you can check that uh, properties one, two, and three are all satisfied by these uh, functions here. So the proof itself is you know, not so important. Uh, what's important is that this can be done and uh, in a Dalphantine way. Right, so pairing we can do in a Dalphantine way, and uh, you know as as was briefly discussed uh, previously, if you want to do like uh, tuples of any fixed length, then you can do that in a Dalphantine way just by iterating this uh, pairing function. But now the the concern is okay, we we want something that works for arbitrary length, so like a single Dalphantine function that works for tuples of any length. Uh, and that's more tricky. Okay, so um, basically the upshot of this slide is that we can do pairing um, using Dalphantine functions. Now, how do we handle sequences? So this is now the idea of a sequence number. Let's uh, go through the statement of the theorem here. So there is a Dalphantine function S, okay? And S takes in two numbers, I and U. Think of U as the code for a sequence. And think of I as the index of uh, an element in the sequence. Okay, now this, this function S, it has the following properties. Well, first, okay, we have this niceness property that SIU is always less than or equals to U, okay? Um, so what is this SIU? Well, that's expressed in the second half of the sentence. For each A1 to AN, it is, okay, so there is some U such that SIU equals to AI. So think of S as kind of extracting the ith entry of a sequence. If U encodes the sequence A, A1 to AN, then SIU is gonna give you AI. So I think I've written this on the slide. Yeah, so think of U as a code for the sequence. Uh, think of SIU as extracting the ith entry of the sequence. So uh, this is a little, you know, this might not be exactly what you expect, right? What you're, what you're thinking is maybe you're thinking, okay, we have like, you know, input uh, some, some numbers and then you want to output a code for the sequence. Uh, but well, that's a bit uh, questionable because well, how do you um, think about having inputs of arbitrary length? That's not a thing that we can have, right? Because the function takes in a fixed number of numbers so we can't feed in sequences of arbitrary length. So instead, all we care about is really, this is like a decoding, right? We're saying that for every sequence, there is some code out there. Uh, there could be multiple codes, in fact, uh, so that those numbers can be decoded from, from this U. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the uh, theorem about sequence numbers. Let's talk about a proof. So as uh, Zuyao said, this is the, the main engine here is the Chinese remainder theorem. So uh, here's the definition of SIU. It's uh, very short. We take L of U and we divide it by one plus I times R of U. Okay, and, and, and take the remainder. That will be that will be SIU. Okay, so you know this this kind of comes up from nowhere, uh, but we'll see in a bit. You know why why this works. Uh, let's check that it has the properties we want. Uh, so the first thing is let's just comment that uh, this is Dalphantine. Okay, and why is that? Well, 
L and R are diophantine, right? These are the L and R from the pairing function on the previous slide. And uh, remainder is also diophantine. That's uh, quite easy to show. And we showed that diophantine functions are closed on the composition. So SIU is defined by composing these uh, diophantine functions, and therefore it is itself diophantine. Okay, now next property, uh, again, this niceness property, well, SIU is always going to be less than or equals to LU because it's the remainder of LU divided by something. So it's always going to be less than or equals to LU. And uh, from the previous slide, the previous theorem, LU is always less than or equals to U. So SIU is less than or equals to U. Okay. Now for the now for the meat, right? Okay, so it's like okay, how how does SIU actually extract uh, these uh, AIs? Right. Uh, we're going to use the Chinese remainder theorem to to do that. So the point is, we're given some sequence a one to a n. We want to be able to find such some u, so that for every i, SIU is going to give us a i. All right, so uh, I've just copied the theorem here and I've also copied the definition of S. Now, suppose we're given some sequence A1 to AN. We want to find U as, as in the theorem. First, we're going to fix a number Y, which is uh, large, okay? So Y is bigger than all of the numbers in A1 to AN. And also Y is divisible by N factorial. Okay, so what does that mean? Basically, I'm trying to say that Y is divisible by every number less than or equals to N. All right, that's what it means to be divisible by N factorial. Uh, well, okay, yeah, that's a, I mean, divisible by N factorial says a bit more than that, but that's really the, the main property that we need. Uh, so with such y in hand, okay, so some this y, just think of it as a large number, which uh, is not divisible by any small numbers. Consider this uh, sequence of numbers, one plus y, one plus two y, all the way dot, 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 to one plus n y. Okay, this sequence, I claim that uh, these are relatively prime. Okay, in other words, uh, if you take any two of these numbers, they have no common factor. Well, why is that? Well, let's suppose two of them have a common factor. Okay, like, you know, let's say one plus two y and one plus five y or something. Well, if they have a common factor, then that common factor must divide their difference. And in this case, in the example I just said, the difference is like three y, for example. Now, it is not possible that this common factor is less than n, okay? And that's because, well, if the, if the common factor was less than n, then you would have something that divides, say, you, you would have something less than n, which divides one plus two y, but that cannot happen because y is divisible by n factorial. Okay, so, so basically we took y, which has a lot of uh, small factors, right? And then we added one to it, right? And so that, that basically uh, eliminates all of the small factors. So, um, yeah, so one plus two y and say one plus five y, you know, they cannot have any small common factors. Which means that, well, uh, in the end, this common factor must actually divide y. Uh, but that's also a problem, right? So either way, the common factor is going to divide y, and that means it cannot divide one plus uh, two y. So uh, that's basically the proof. Okay, so there's some, just some you know, basic uh, number theory. Now, uh, how does this help us? Well, this is exactly the setting that we need to apply the Chinese remainder theorem. 
so by the Chinese Remender theorem, we know that, well, if you have a sequence of uh, relatively prime numbers, then we, for any sequence of kind of moduli that we want for each of the numbers, we can find a single number which kind of uh, witnesses all of these moduli. So we get a single X such that for each I, X is uh, congruent to AI mod one plus IY. So X here, we should think of as essentially the code of the sequence AI. Uh, but so for technical reasons, right, we want to think, uh, we want to actually have the code be a pair. So we take U to be P of uh, X comma Y, because really the, sorry, really the, um, we need both X and Y in order to extract the information. So that's the definition of uh, U. Why does it work? Okay, let's think about, let's think about this. So let's show that for each I, SIU is equal to AI. Well, what is SIU? Well, first we have to take LU. LU is just L of PXY, which is X. So we're taking the remainder of X when divided by one plus I times RU. Well, RU is exactly Y. So we're taking the remainder of X divided by one plus I Y, which is exactly A I by choice of X. So that's how the, that's why the encoding uh, works here. So uh, yeah, so that's the, that's the proof of the theorem, right? Um, we've managed to, in a way, encode um, sequences of arbitrary length as a single, as single numbers. And uh, the main tool here is the Chinese remainder theorem, which is uh, very useful for this kind of purpose. Any, any questions about uh, this proof? Okay, cool. So that's one obstacle out of the way, right? So previously we were talking about, okay, we want to prove that Dalphantine functions are closed under primitive recursion. Uh, that kind of, uh, that kind of exposed the need to encode sequences as numbers. And, and now we've uh, achieved that. Uh, however, there are still uh, significant issues that we need to overcome. So uh, let's now move on to another issue here. And uh, basically, okay, so I'm not really going to describe the um, like obstacle here, but I'm just gonna say like, okay, here is something that would suffice to get what we want. And this is the uh, idea of bounded quantification. So let's, let's read this theorem and, and the theorem basically says what bounded quantification means. So the theorem says, okay, if we have a Dalphantine thing, okay, this is capital P polynomial equation, a bunch of variables. If this is Dalphantine, okay, then if you look at a set of uh, B and X, such that the following equation holds, well, the following formula holds, uh, this is Dalphantine as well. And notice here, so if you look at just the second half of the formula, this uh, the existential quantifier and after, well, that's, that's a Dalphantine thing, right? Um, this is how a Dalphantine definition looks like. But what's new here is this quantifier in front. It's a universal quantifier over Z. And furthermore, it's bounded. So which means that we are, we're not looking at every Z, we're just looking at the Z which are less than or equals to B, okay? So if, if we didn't have the bound, okay? If, if we had this definition here, but without the bound, uh, that is definitely not Dalphantine in general, okay? Um, but here's the, the, the main point of this theorem is that, well, if we have a bound, Okay, if, if, we, if we are allowed to do universal quantification, but with a bound uh, that keeps us within the 
Diophantine functions. And uh, on the next slide, I'll, I'll show you an example, right, of how this can help us. Like, you know, like you might be thinking, okay, well, like, you know, why, what does this have to do with anything? Well, on the next slide, we'll, I'll give you an example. So this theorem uh, is really the, our next main goal, and it's going to take a very, very long time to get to it. Uh, okay, so yeah, in words, what this theorem says is that the Diophantine uh, relations is closed under bounded quantification. And uh, so before we start on the proof, okay, I want to give you some corollaries of this theorem, uh, just to convince you that it's actually something that we want, something that's something that helps us. Okay, so as promised, an example. We can use this theorem about bounded quantification to very easily show that the set of prime numbers is Dalfantine. So uh, recall from well, last lecture, we gave an example of a Dalfantine set, which is the set of composite numbers. Okay, and here's the Dalfantine definition. It's very simple, right? If we want to say that X is composite, well, we just want to say that X is the uh, product of two, two numbers, which are at least uh, greater than one, right? Uh, so that's very easy. Now, if we, if we try to do the kind of the complement of the set, right? If we want to try to come up with a, a Diophantine equation that has, that has solutions only if uh, some parameter is prime, uh, that's a lot harder. Okay, and uh, but bounded quantification uh, allows us to do it. So how do we do it? Well, so here's the theorem: uh, set of prime numbers is the set of prime numbers is Diophantine. And here's the definition using bounded quantification. So x is prime if and only if. Well, first of all, x is greater than one. Okay, uh, just removing the h case here, and we want to say for all y and z. Uh, less than or equals to x. So here, this less than or equals to x is very important because that's the bound. Uh, we a bunch of things, uh, like one of these four disjunctions must hold. So the first two disjunctions, uh, this guy, well, basically it's saying that uh, y, yz must be equals to, no, sorry, yz, yeah, yz is not equals to x, okay? So this is something that we can specify in a Diophantine way by specifying these two uh, inequalities. Uh, either one of them must be true. And then really here is probably what you're expecting, which is that, well, um, if yz is equals to x, then either y is one or z is one. So basically this guy here, this entire thing here can be rewritten as an implication where we say if yz equals to x, then y is one or z is one. The reason why I've, re I've written it in this uh, weird way is because in this way, it's clear that it's actually Diophantine, right? Um, because we never talked about implications in Diophantine relations, technically that's not allowed, but we can just rephrase it to uh, make it into a legal thing. Oh, sorry. So, uh, the point here is, well, this is a definition of being prime, okay? And furthermore, it is it uses uh, bounded quantification in front of a Diophantine thing. So by the theorem on bounded quantification, uh, this is indeed a Diophantine definition. Again, let me emphasize here the key point, which is that, well, if we're looking for like some, uh, some yz that is uh, then multiplied to become x, well, then we know that we only need to search for the numbers less than or equals to x. So this, this gives us a bound, you know, so we don't have to search for, you know, arbitrarily large numbers. We just have to search all the numbers less than x. So uh, that's, this is the main thing that makes this uh, work. Okay, so here's an example of what bounded quantification can do for us, uh, which would be quite hard to do otherwise. Uh, but moving away from this specific example, go, like towards our general goal, okay, bounded quantification can let us do primitive recursion, which is the, uh, 
the, one of the things that we want to do. So here's a corollary of the theorem. The alpha and teen functions are closed under primitive recursion. Let's see uh, the proof here. So here, again, I've just repeated what it means to define something by uh, Delphantine, no, by primitive recursion. So remember, we have the F and we have the G. F is like the base case. G is like the thing that you iterate. So you keep applying it to F. And H is the function that you get at the end, uh, defined by this scheme. Now. Uh, so the goal here is we want to show that H is uh, the alpha antine, right? And as we were discussing a few slides ago, we want to basically say that, well, Z is equals to H of XT if uh, there is some number that encodes like some kind of history proving that Z is equals to H of XT. So think of the history as like a proof, right? It's like a, um, a witness that, that Z is actually H of XT because it shows you the steps that you took in order to get to get there. And so this is the kind of the, uh, the a Diophantine definition. So uh, Y is equals to H of XZ. Oh, so sorry, I changed the notation a bit. Uh, so this is the thing we're interested in defining. This is true if and only if uh, there are numbers U and V. Okay, uh, such that, well, first, V is equals to S of zero U. Okay, so uh, how do we think of U and V here? Think of U as the code of a sequence, the, the sequence, which is the history, okay? And uh, V here, well, V is just the first entry of the sequence, right? S of zero U, that's the, that's the S function gives us the, uh, the zero of entry in this case. And so V here is S of zero U, the first entry of the sequence. And we demand that V must be equals to F of X. So this is the first condition that the history must satisfy, right? The, the beginning of the history must be correct. It must be the correct uh, base case uh, given by F. Now for condition two, so condition two is talking about the uh, iteration now. So we're saying, okay, for all t less than z, uh, there is some w, so that uh, w is equals to s t plus one u. Okay, so again, s of t plus one u is taking the t plus one entry in the history, and we require that w is obtained by applying g to the teeth entry in the history. So this is saying that the history is kind of coherent under the iteration by G, right? It's saying that each step other than the first is obtained by applying G to the step before it. And that's what we want the history to satisfy, right? That's the, um, that's the definition of, of what it means to be a good valid history. Finally, uh, we want to have this, uh, the last one. So we're just saying that, okay, now look at the uh, Z entry of the sequence, then uh, that must be equals to Y. So uh, that's the, this is the kind of uh, equivalent form of Y equals to H of XZ and the whole point of this equivalent form is that it is uh, Diophantine, right? All the things that we've used here are allowed to be used in defining Diophantine things, right? We start with some existential quantifiers. Okay, that's good. We have capital S, we have F, both of these are Diophantine. We have a bounded quantifier over T here, and that's Diophantine by the theorem. Uh, and again, we have some existential, we have capital S, we have G, capital S, all of those are Diophantine. So of course, if you, if you want to write this out explicitly, it's going to be um, pretty long, but uh, basically everything we've done here is all Diophantine stuff by the results that we have claimed. 
So yeah, so this is uh, the proof that the Diophantine functions are closed under primitive recursion. Uh, a bit of a side comment. So let me just point out that uh, if there is some u, okay, um, if there if there are u and v such that these one two three hold, it's actually possible that u is like too long. Okay, I'm not I'm not saying anything about the length of u um, being exactly z. It's it's okay for u to be very long, as long as the first uh, z entries of u, as as given by the capital S, uh, as long as those first z entries of u are correct, they give a correct history, uh, then then we're good, right? So so actually there there are many many possible u that might witness this, uh, and and that's okay, right? That's not it doesn't break anything. Okay, so, so this here is like one big application of bounded quantification. It allows us to do uh, primitive recursion, which is definitely what we need to do if we want to show that uh, every recursive function is uh, delphin t eventually. Any questions about uh, this proof? Okay, now uh, I think I have another corollary here. Uh -huh. So another closure property of the class of Delphantin, no, of the class of recursive functions is uh, minimization. So I guess if you don't remember what that is, that's okay. In this proof, I will kind of remind you what it is. Uh, but basically this is another thing that we need to show that the Delphantin functions are closed under. Uh, because the recursive functions are closed under this. So the Delphantine functions had better be closed under this as well. All right, so uh, what does minimization mean? So suppose we have some uh, function f, okay? And the assumption here is that for each tuple x, uh, there is some y such that f of x, y equals to zero. Okay, so that's that's kind of the basic setup if you want to do a minimization thing. Um, for each x, there is some y. There could be multiple y, but we just require that there is at least one y. Now, the minimization of f is now defined to be h as follows. So for each x, we define h of x to be the least y. So in the sense of the natural number ordering, such that f of x, y equals to zero. So we might have multiple y's such that f of x, y equals to zero. This h is responsible for picking the least one every time. Okay, so that's, uh, that's so h is the minimization of f and our goal now is to show that h is Dalfantine. Well, let's do this using bounded quantification. And this is very short. So y is equals to h of x. Well, if and only if uh, two things are true. Well, first, so if y is going to be the least one such that f of x, y equals to zero, well, first of all, it had better be true that f of x, y is equals to zero. Okay, so that's something that we can check, right? That's tau fantine because f is tau fantine. Uh, but furthermore, right, what does it mean to be the least one? Well, it means that for everything smaller than u, f of x uh, of, that, of that smaller thing is not zero. And in this case here, we're talking about functions on the, you know, from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. So uh, being non-zero just means you are strictly greater than zero. So we need to say that, okay, for all t less than y, f of x t is greater than zero. And so the, the combination of these two conditions is equivalent to y being h of x. And this is again Delphantine because the first one was Delphantine. Second one is also Delphantine because of this uh, bounded quantifier in front of a Dalfantine thing. So again, uh, with the help of bounded quantifiers, we can show that uh, another closure property of the class of Dalfantine functions. Now with these theorems, so the theorem on this slide, 
as well as the theorem on the previous slide, actually we've already essentially showed that every recursive function is tau fantine. Modulo, the theorem about bounded quantification. Okay, so that is the, that is the, the main thing that we're gonna work on. Uh, but what I've just done over the past two slides is I've basically showed you that if we can do that, the bounded quantification thing, then we have achieved our main goal, which is to show that the Dalfantine functions are the same as the recursive functions. There is a little more that I'm not spelling out here, but those are fairly trivial. So for example, uh, the, you need to show that the, the, the class of recursive functions um, is the smallest class which contains certain functions. So you need to show that those functions are Dalfantine, but you know those are uh, pretty easy. So I'm going to skip them. Uh, so the point now is what's remaining is we got to prove bounded quantification. And a major step towards that is to prove that the exponential function is Dalfantine. Okay, and this, this is actually the, historically, this was the last thing to be done in the uh, resolution of Hubert's 10 problem. Uh, so this was done by Matthias Sevich in 1970. Uh, he showed that the exponential function is tau fantine. And uh, previously, so why do I say that this was the last step, right? So what had people done before Matthias Sevich? Well, uh, Davis, Putnam, and Robinson in 61, they had showed that Hilbert's 10 problem for exponential Dalfantine equations is unsolvable. So I'm not gonna define what exponential Dalfantine equations are. Essentially just imagine that, okay, it's like a polynomial, but you're allowed to use exponentials in there, right? So um, it's, not, uh, it's not a Dalfantine equation, right? It's a different thing because you have exponentials in there. Uh, but if, exponentials are Dalfantine, then you can kind of transform it into a Dalfantine equation. So uh, that's why, you know, that's kind of how you can combine these two theorems to show that Hilbert's 10 problem is unsolvable. I'm being vague here because uh, this is not the approach that we'll take, right? So we're not going to prove the last theorem on the slide. Uh, instead, we will kind of prove um, the unsolvability directly quote unquote. But uh, I'm just giving you some kind of uh, history here you know, that you know, this exponential function being Dalfantine is actually very hard, right? Because it was like the last thing that, the last piece of the puzzle. So I will go now for the next, um, you know, next hour maybe, is to prove uh, Matiasevich uh, theorem. So uh, we will show, oh yes, question. Uh, just uh, just a quick one. Uh, so yeah. exponential function is Diophantine and um, exponential Diophantine equation is unsolvable. Um, mm, how how is that connected? Oh, so well, I mean, as in these two theorems can be pieced together to show that Hilbert's ten problem for ordinary Diophantine equations is unsolvable okay. because because like. Basically, uh, by Matthias Savage theorem, you can transform each exponential Dalfantine equation into an ordinary Dalfantine equation, like removing uh -huh. the exponential. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 yeah mm -hmm. That's the connection. But but I'm you know I'm being a bit vague about it because this is not the approach that we will take to solve mm -hmm. to show unsolvability. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, so for yeah for the next hour we're going to focus on proving that the exponential function is Dalfantine. This is actually yeah it's quite tedious. Uh, I will skip some steps, but I hope to give you at least some flavor of how it's proved. Okay, so uh, now towards that goal, okay, we're going to look at Pell's equation. So I mentioned Pell's equation way at the beginning. This is the equation x squared minus dy equals to one where d is some uh, positive integer, okay? And so Pell's equation is, is very interesting to, to number theorists, right? And, and it has actually been studied uh, since ancient Greece. Well, why is that? So notice that if uh, x, y is a solution of this equation, uh, say with natural numbers, okay? x and y natural numbers, 
and uh, if y is not zero, uh, then if you take x divided by y, that's actually a good approximation of the square root of d. Okay, because you rearrange the equation, right? You take you take dy squared, you move it to the right. You take one, you move it to the left, and then you divide both sides by y squared, and then you take the square root, right? So that that tells you that x over y is very close to uh, square root of d. And, and this can be made precise, right? So, you know, to what extent is this a good approximation? Well, this is actually um, the x over y, I think is maybe exactly the continued fraction convergence uh, of square root of d. Like if you take the continued fraction expansion of square root of d and you take finite pieces of that, uh, that's gonna give you the x over y's. Uh, I'm not gonna define that here, but just mentioning it in case you, you want to look it up on your own. So this is why this equation has been, you know, interesting to people because, well, approximating the square root of a number is of a practical interest, right? You want to have like, uh, you want to have an area, you want to have a square of some area, well, you want to know how long does the side have to be? Well, that's, that's an approximation to the square root. Um, I want to say a bit about the history of this equation because, well, uh, first of all, uh, this has been studied since ancient Greece and also studied heavily in uh, India. So uh, people like uh, Brahma, Brahmagupta around seventh century AD. And it appears that uh, Brownker, who around 1650, I think uh, he gave a method for producing uh, all solutions of the equation. Um, but he kind of gave like a method which, uh, with, you know, without a proof. So uh, Lagrange was the first to really um, give what we would consider a proof of like, okay, these are all the solutions, you know, like here's how you can generate all solutions and there are no other solutions other than this. Um, so why is it called Pell's equation? Well, actually it's a misattribution. So it seems that Pell had a very small role to play, if, if any. And uh, I looked in the book, uh, this book by Dixon. So Dixon blames Euler for this misattribution. So, well, you know, Euler is a big deal. So if Euler said that Pell did it, then, you know, people started repeating that, that fact, uh, even though it was false. So, so definitely Pell didn't do it. I'm not 100% sure who actually did it first in the sense that, um, sure, I mean, Lagrange gave a proof, but before that, it seems that people were already aware of how to do it, like, you know, possibly even in uh, ancient India. So yeah, I, I'll leave that question for the historians, but the point here is that, you know, <laughs> this is a, a Pell shouldn't get credit for, for this. Okay, so yeah, if you wanna look, if you wanna look more, you can look at this book, uh, History of the Theory of Numbers. It's, uh, it's really an encyclopedia on, on number theory. Um, okay, now let's look at the, the math right, behind this equation. Uh, wh what, are the, what are the solutions? How do they look like? Uh, so for simplicity, uh, we will focus on the case where d is a squared minus y, okay? and a is some integer greater or equals to two. Now notice by the way that, so if d is a square, uh, then this equation is not very interesting, right? So um, the, the only interesting case is when d is not a square, and uh, specifically this case where d is like a square minus one, uh, this is a case that uh, theoretically quite simple and it's nice to work with. So, so we're gonna work with that. So here's a complete description of the solutions of Pell's equation. So a pair xy is a solution to this equation if and only if uh, there is some k greater or equals to zero such that x plus y times square root of a squared minus one is the kth power of a plus a squared minus, no, a plus square root of a squared minus one. Okay, so, so the, the sequence of solutions is, is very nice, right? It's given to us uh, by just looking at the powers of a single number. Uh, in this case, this is a real number, right? It's not an integer, but uh, you, you, look at this, you look at this real number, take its bunch of powers, and you can separate it out into these two parts and, 
uh, that's that gives us the the solutions. Okay, so uh, what what this is usually called is that if you look at the um, like the, the smaller solution here is called kind of the fundamental solution. And then you kind of take powers of that to uh, generate uh, more and more. Okay, so these, these are how the solutions look like. And we're gonna use these sequences uh, to help us. And, and first of all, well, the kind of the, um, there, there are several things to be proved here about why this is useful. So first of all, Eventually, we will show that these, uh, okay, I'm kind of jumping the gun. So let's define the sequences now. For each K, let's define XKA. So this is an, uh, a natural number. And YKA, also a natural number, uh, to be the K solution, essentially. So, so XKA is here, YKA is here. We know that uh, every solution looks like this, right? And so we're just indexing it by, by K, depending on the power. Uh, let's let's see some examples, right? I, like explicitly, what are these uh, in terms of A? Uh, so just repeating the definition here, and here is a table of the uh, first few values. So for k equals to zero, uh, all we get is xka is one and yka is zero. So that's a that is a solution to Pell's equation, right? You can check because the this this term just becomes zero and this term is one. So that, that is, that's a solution. Uh, not a very interesting solution, but it is a solution. Uh, so for k equals to one, well, what do we get? Uh, in this case, well, this, this xk would be a and yka would be one. So again, you can see that uh, it is a solution to Pell's equation. Now, uh, starting from two onwards, well, things get more interesting. So I've put the polynomials here. And here's for here's the ones for k equals to three. Okay, um, I've highlighted these because I want to make a point uh, soon. But before I move on, right? Does anybody uh, recognize these polynomials from from anywhere? Just uh, waiting a bit in case you want to try to uh, rack your brain. <laughs> I think about yeah, think about things like two a squared minus one. Right? That's that's a um, and also this this guy here like four a cubed minus three a. Um, maybe that rings a bell for for some of you. I don't know. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll just uh, I'll just review it. It's, I mean, it's totally okay if you if you didn't get it. Um, but these guys are actually uh, quite well known. These are called the Chebyshev polynomials. Okay, so so the XKAs are like Chebyshev polynomials of the first kind. YKAs are Chebyshev polynomials of the second kind, and they appear in uh, several parts of math. And uh, the reason why I said you might have found them familiar is because. Uh, the XKAs, for example, are associated to the addition formulas for uh, cosine of uh, K theta for, for K being some uh, integer. Like if you have cosine three theta, you expand this in terms of cosine theta. This is what you get, four times cosine cubed theta minus three cosine theta. And so this is exactly the, the polynomial here in blue uh, if A equals to cosine of theta. On the other hand, for the y's, uh, you can get them by taking expanding sine of three theta, sine of k theta in general, uh, and dividing it by sine of theta. That's going to give you a polynomial in cosine of theta if you, you know, if you work a bit. And this is exactly uh, the polynomial here. Again, if a is equals to cosine of theta. So uh, yeah, pretty pretty cool, I think. Um, and these, these polynomials, they, they come up uh, in various places. Well, we've, we've seen two places, right? One is Pell's equation, and 
uh, another one is this uh, trig formulas. Uh, so yeah, hopefully this gives you a bit of, um, you know, now we have a slightly better idea on what these XKA and YKAs are. The, the goal now, like what does this have to do with the exponential function, right? You're probably wondering, uh, and, and that will be reviewed soon. The, the point is that, well, uh, the plan is basically in two phases now. Uh, in one phase, we're gonna show that these XKA and YKA, they define, they, they are Diophantine functions. Okay, uh, that's gonna be quite hard. Uh, but the, the second phase of this is to show that, well, if XKA and YKA are Diophantine, then we can use them to give a Diophantine definition of the exponential function. And uh, that's what we do right now because it's uh, less technical. So we're gonna kind of you know, warm up to the technical stuff. Uh, so yeah, this is the plan, as I just said. Uh, so here are some basic properties about XKA and YKA. Um, like the, what exactly is happening here in this lemma? Uh, it's not so important. Uh, oh, by the way, I've, I kind of suppressed the bracket A here because otherwise the whole statement looks quite unwieldy. Uh, but the point here is that these are recurrences that are satisfied by the XK sequences and the YK sequences, right? They are, you know, these are like kind of intertwined and whereas these are just purely the Xs, these are purely the Ys. So, uh, well, why are recurrences good? Well, because now we can, if we have a recurrence, then we can uh, improve things by induction which is a well, very useful technique. So using this lemma, okay, so I'm not talking about the proof of this lemma, I'm just gonna skip it, uh, but using this lemma, we can, uh, an induction, we can prove stuff. Like for example, uh, we can talk about the growth rate of the XKA sequence. And here's a, a first hint that it might be useful. Uh, it actually grows exponentially. Uh, specifically, we have the following bound, which uh, you can show by induction. So XKA is always greater or equals to A to the K and is always less than or equals to 2A to the K. Uh, so again, I will skip the proof of this lemma, but it is basically induction using these uh, recurrences. And the idea now is... Um, since XKA grows quickly, all we need to do, like to use it to pin down the exponential function, we just need to use some kind of modular arithmetic. So uh, what do I mean by that? This is the, uh, a, an idea of Robinson, okay, Julia, Julia Robinson uh, from 1952. So Julia Robinson showed that uh, so here we have n to the k, so that's the exponential. And here we have something that is in terms of xk and yk. These two things, they are equal modulo this uh, expression here. Okay. Let's, uh, let's talk about the proof of this because I think it's, you know, it, it, is, it is quite elementary and it is very elegant. So, uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, this you might be wondering where this expression comes from, like 2an minus n squared minus 1. Uh, so if you know about generating functions, then uh, this will seem a bit less mysterious because uh, this expression actually appears in the generating function of the xk and the yk. So it is something that is quite related to xk and yk. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't come from nowhere, so to speak. Okay, let's look at the proof. Uh, the proof is uh, by induction. Uh, what is the base case? Well, the base case is k equals to zero. And in this case, it's trivial because the exponential becomes one. And this guy here, well, uh, xk is one and yk is zero. So this expression here is just one. So for the base case, uh, these two are just equal. So of course they are equal modulo anything. So that's the base case. For an inductive step, we have the following calculation. So let's do this calculation modulo 
this uh, expression, 2an minus n squared minus 1. Let's begin with xk plus 1 minus a minus n times yk plus 1. Okay, so we're assuming that it's true for k. We want to show that it's true for k plus 1. Well, first of all, let's expand this uh, using the recurrences that we have from the lemma. So xk plus 1 can be expanded as follows. yk plus 1 can be expanded as follows. And now let's do a bit of rearranging here. So what we've done is, well, we want to kind of extract these terms, like xk minus a minus n yk, as well as xk minus 1 minus a minus n yk minus 1. Right. The reason why we want to extract these is because, well, then we can apply the inductive hypothesis to them. And that's what we'll do next, right? Um, so by inductive hypothesis, this first guy is equal to n to the k modulo this expression. And also by inductive hypothesis, so uh, using strong induction, uh, this guy is equals to this modulo and uh, modulo this guy. And now this guy here, well, we can, again, uh, kind of rearrange it a bit, right? So we factor out the n to the k minus 1. That leaves us 2an minus 1. Well, 2an minus 1 is, of course, equals to n squared if you take modulo 2an minus n squared minus 1. And finally, well, now we have two powers of n. Just merge them together, we get n to the k plus 1. So that's what we wanted, right? We wanted to show that this guy and the exponential are equivalent, and that's what we've done. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, I think this is uh, very neat, and uh, yeah, uh, hopefully you you think that it's cool. Yeah. I think it's very cool. Any, any questions about this, uh, this lemma here? No. Nope. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, so now let's, let's kind of tie it together, right? So, so we have two facts now about the X case and the Y case. Well, so, yeah, um, like one of them is we know about the growth rate of the X case. We know it's like roughly exponential. And now we have this congruence, which kind of relates the exponential function and the X case and the Y case. Well, now we can tie them together to give a Dalphantine definition of uh, the exponential function, assuming we have a Dalphantine definition of X, K and Y, K. And this is as follows. So, uh, suppose we have okay some we have some n and some k here, then for every a which is sufficiently large, okay. So so this is x k n. This the exact value of this um, is going to be relevant in the proof. The point here is n to the k can be defined by taking the remainder of this guy here divided by this guy here. Okay, so, so why is this? All right, so I claim that this is obtained by combining the previous two results that we talked about. Well, first, uh, by Robinson's congruence, which is what we just showed, right, all we need to show is that actually n to the k is less than uh, this guy here. Because we know that n to the k is uh, congruent modulo this guy. Uh, to this guy. So if we want to show that it's the remainder, right, the only thing that's left is to show that actually this guy is less than the thing that we're dividing by. You know, that, that's what we, we need this, right, to be a, for it to be a remainder. Okay, so how do we get this inequality? Well, let's, let's look at it. So first we have n to the k. Now by the lemma on the growth rate of the xk sequence, we know that n to the k is less than x k n. Okay, so that's by the by the lemma that was uh, that can be proved by induction. And then by assumption, we chose some a large enough so that a is greater than x k n. So this is where the the a greater than x k n comes in in the statement. And now the last thing is to show that a is less than or equals to 2an minus n squared minus 1. 
Uh, so this is an elementary calculation which I've just displayed here. Okay, so you can, if you want to show this inequality, you can rearrange it to look like this. And these, these things hold by these elementary things. So I don't expect you to read it now. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just showing you because I'm just saying that, okay, like this is actually uh, elementary. So we're not using any theorems here. The, the upshot here, right, is that like, what's the, what's the point here? The point is that, okay, XKN grows quickly. So if we have something that uh, kind of you know, grows quickly and has some uh, modular arithmetic relationship to the thing we want to define, then we can kind of uh, combine those two together to give like some definition. Like this, so this definition is of the form like this guy that we want is the remainder of something divided by something. You know, that's something that will come up again and again. It's a very uh, useful technique in this area. So this corollary shows the following. If we are able to define this guy in a Dalfantine way, the x case and the y case, well, then we will get a Dalfantine definition of uh, the exponential given by this, right? We say that it is the remainder of this guy divided by this guy. So. So this now, now our goal is to really focus on the X case and the Y case uh, and show that they are Dalfantine. Uh, but yeah, maybe before we do that, um, maybe it's, <laughs> I, of course this is, it's a bit past the hour, but maybe it's a good time for a break or what do, what do people think? I would say yes. You can take sure. a short break. Yeah. Uh, how many? How many minutes? <laughs> um. What do you think? Five, five, five? minutes. Five minutes. Five? Yeah. Five mm -hmm. minutes sounds good. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Yeah. So see you back in five minutes. Yep. All right, I guess that's the sign for me to continue. So uh, welcome back if you're still here. Uh, yeah, the reason why I called for a break is because well, what's coming up is going to be maybe the most technical part of the talk, this entire lecture series for, for me. Um, so let's just you know quickly recap. Okay, what, what have we done so far? So yeah, the point here is that uh, our goal is to show that the exponential function is Delphantine, and we have just reduced it to the problem of showing that xka and yka are Delphantine. Now we're going to work towards the, the latter. Uh, in order to do that, we need more properties about xk and yk. Okay? Um, here's one property. Again, this is a kind of a like uh, modular arithmetic. The basic idea here is that we are relating the properties of yka and a, okay? So, so this lemma here, right? It says that a minus one divides yka minus k. So uh, it's like, you know, this is some divisibility relationship between something about a and something about yka. Uh, kind of a similar lemma that will also be useful is the following. So. Uh, instead of taking one here, if you take some arbitrary b, right, then a minus b actually divides uh, yka minus ykb. And uh, I mean, there is a way that the first lemma can be seen as a special case of the second, but um, technically speaking, because we were only talking about a's, which are at least two, so, you know, some, some care is required. Uh, but either way, you know, these lemmas are not things that we're going to prove, but uh, we will use it uh, down the line. The idea is that, okay, we know something about now the relationship between yka and a in terms of divisibility. Furthermore, we also have some lemmas which uh, say something slightly different. So now these lemmas, they relate yqa. Uh, I've kind of changed the notation to be in line with when we use it uh, in the proof later. So now the relationship is between YQA and Q. Okay, so it's not about YQA and A, it's about YQA and Q. 
let's look at this first lemma here, which uh, we will call the step down lemma one. So it says that uh, if you have yka squared uh, dividing yqa, this happens if and only if k times yka actually divides q. So again, this is kind of like relating the uh, properties about yka and k. And over here we have yqa and q. So you know, in a sense, you're just kind of stepping down, right? You're stepping down from talking about the sequence of yqa to just talking about the, the sequence of q, very vaguely speaking. Um, and again, we have this uh, another step down lemma, the second one, which also has a uh, similar flavor. So we're saying that, okay, yra is congruent modulo xqa to ypa. Okay, so this is a mouthful. If and only if r is congruent to plus minus p mod 2q. So again, the reading here is that notice that we've basically went from something about yra to something about r. And over here, we have some, we've went from something about ypa to something about p and xqa to something about q. So it's kind of the, the, the vague, uh, I mean, this is not, you know, it's not a proof that it's true, but I'm just trying to kind of explain the, the context of these results. Um, okay, so, so obviously, you know, you know, I don't expect you to, to remember uh, what these lemmas say, and, and we won't talk about the proofs, uh, but later I'll just refer to their names and, and hopefully you'll just believe me that, you know, these are lemmas that, that we know are true. Okay, now here's the theorem now. Here's the Diophantine definition of XKA and YKA in the flesh. This is it. Like <laughs> these nine equations together uh, define the sequence, you know, they define the XKA and YKA. So let's, uh, let's read through this uh, theorem. So first we're talking about this uh, relation here. So this is a four place relation. We have A, K, C, and D. So the role of a and k we know, right? So remember a is like the a squared minus one in Pell's equation. Uh, k is like the index of the solution, okay? And uh, c and d here, well, c is meant to be xka and d is meant to be yka. So this tuple here, well, it satisfies this condition uh, if and only if the following holds. So everything here, this is supposed to be a Diophantine definition of these two sequences. Well, first we start with some existential quantifiers over the following numbers, E, F, G, H, I. We'll, we'll talk about them as they come up, such that the following holds. So the first three equations, these are Pell equations, right? This is exactly the form of a Pell equation where the first one you have C and D as the kind of solution. And then the A here is the, you know, the A squared minus one. Okay, so what we're saying here is that, well, C and D are solutions to this Pell equation, uh, which it had better be, right? Because uh, definitely these guys, XKA and YKA, are solutions to this same Pell equation. So, you know, I think one is a very natural property to, to want. Uh, two and three though, okay, so these are somewhat indirect, right? So these uh, E and F, uh, as well as GHI, these are kind of auxiliary, uh, things that we will use. So we want E and F to also satisfy the same Pell equation as C and D, uh, but of course the, they might be a different index, right? So, so E and F might not be equals to C and D, you know, it's just some other solution maybe. As for H and I, so those are also solutions to a Pell equation, but a different equation. So notice here that we have now G instead of A. Okay, so this G here is the G that, that is you know, quantified over here. Uh, so again, it, it, I don't expect you to see why this is uh, useful at all. We'll talk about it as we go through the proof. Um, so one, two, and three Pell equations, okay? And now, okay, there's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, I guess four to eight, okay? These are all uh, modular arithmetic, right? These are all congruences. Right, 2d squared divides f, you can, you can think of it as a congruence. 
uh, these are all congruences involving the various uh, variables that we have. And nine is an inequality that's, uh, it's, again, it's gonna be useful somewhere in the proof. So for now, um, all, all, we, all I want to point out is that uh, all of these guys are Diophantine. Right, so, so okay, individually they are Diophantine and you know, we know how to combine various Diophantine equations into one. Uh, so, so if we wanted to really write down uh, a single equation to define these, uh, we could in, in theory. All right, let's talk about the proof of this theorem now. So I will give you the, the whole proof, okay. Um, there are two directions, all right, this is an if and only if. So let's talk about uh, one direction first. So now we are assuming that uh, C is equals to XKA and D is equals to YKA. And our job is to show that the, the points one to nine on the previous slide uh, are true. And uh, furthermore, we need to define the EFGHI, which uh, make them true. So here is the uh, definition of the EFGHI. And uh, I've also defined an extra Q. So Q again is an auxiliary variable. Um, so Q is just something that we define here. Q is K times YKA. Uh, again, why we do this will be clearer later. Uh, but now the point is E and F are uh, a solution to a Pell equation where the uh, the, 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 the index is 2q, okay? So uh, just by immediate from the definition of E and F, uh, we know that they satisfy uh, some Pell equation like x squared uh, minus a squared minus one times y squared equals to one, right? Because E and F are pairs, right? This is x 2qa, this is y 2qa. So we know that they satisfy some Pell equation, uh, specifically the, the one with a squared minus one. Uh, now for G, again, the definition of G might be a bit mysterious, but the point is now that H and I also by definition satisfy the Pell equation with uh, G squared minus one. So just from the definition alone, right? Without uh, worrying about technicalities, we already can satisfy uh, the points one, two, three on the previous slide because all of those were Pell equations and we set up uh, our numbers to be solutions to those Pell equations. Uh, now it remains to verify the uh, congruences as well as the inequality on the previous slide. So let's start with uh, point number four. So point number four, I've repeated it here. It is 2D squared divides F. Okay, so why, why should that be true? Okay, so uh, here we're gonna use uh, SDL1. Okay, so SDL1 tells us that if K times YKA divides Q, okay, then YKA squared must divide YQA. Okay, so that's just, that's just an application of SDL1, okay? Now, how does that help us? Well, uh, notice that, well, uh, YKA squared, so YKA is exactly D, right, by assumption. So YKA squared is D squared. Okay, so we're getting somewhere, right? We're interested in 2D squared dividing F, uh, so we've actually gotten D squared dividing something. Uh, now look, let's look at the definition of F now. It is Y2QA. And uh, here I'm using a formula which I have not introduced, but uh, kind of if thinking about the trigonometry analogy, uh, these sequences actually satisfy like a double angle formula. So Y2QA is actually two times XQA times YQA. Okay, so this is a formula that uh, I haven't introduced, but it is true. Uh, so that, that gives us what we want, right? Because we know that D squared divides this term here. And here we have the missing two. So therefore two D squared uh, divides F. So yeah, that's the, that's the proof of four that two D squared uh, divides F. Let's uh, move on to five now. So what was five? Oh, five was G is uh, congruent to A mod E. Okay, so that's 
easy because just look at the definition of G here. Well, we have something, uh, the second term here is divisible by E. So, and then there's the A here. So that's why G is A mod E. So immediate from definition. Next, we have to show that G is congruent to one mod two D. Okay. Uh, now first by two, so remember two is the uh, Pell equation that relates E and F. Okay. And if you look at the Pell equation, it, it tells us that uh, actually E squared is gonna be one mod F squared. That's just, you know, because of the form of the Pell equation. And now let's look now at four, which, you, which we just showed, two D squared divides F. So in particular, two D divides F squared, right? That's a, that's a much weaker statement, but it's certainly true. So we can just, uh, instead we can sort of downgrade the, 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 the mod thing. So we can downgrade it to a factor. Uh, e squared must be one mod. Uh, 2D. Okay. Now let's look again at the definition of G. And let's think about its, uh, you know, like its modulo 2D. Well, uh, we have the first term here. Well, that's just A. Okay, nothing we can do with that. Now, this second term. Well, it's the product of e squared and e squared minus a. Now, e squared is one mod 2d. So this guy, first guy here is one. And, oh, sorry. And this guy here is one minus a. So one times one minus a, that's one minus a. And then you add it to a, that's going to give us one. So uh, the, oh, I skipped too far. So, uh, again, going back to the definition of G, we see that, sorry, sorry for the <laughs> mess up here, but yeah. So back, going back to six, right? Um, by definition of G, we get that G is one mod 2D. So uh, yeah. Okay, now to make some space for the subsequent points, I'm gonna hide number four. And uh, let's move on now to number seven. Okay, so number seven says that I is K mod 2D. Okay, well, uh, we're going to prove this in uh, kind of two, two steps. So the point is that we want to show that 2D divides I minus K, right? That's the same, it's an equivalent way of saying this. Now by six, we know that 2D divides G minus one, right? Because G is one mod 2D, so 2D divides G minus one. And then we had this uh, lemma by Robinson earlier that tells us that G minus one divides YKG minus K. Well, what is YKG minus K? Uh, YKG is equals to I by definition. So G minus one divides I minus K. Now combining those two facts together, we get 2D divides I minus K, which is what we wanted. Uh, next for eight. So eight is I is D mod E. Okay, so now um, what do we have here? So uh, we want to show that E divides I minus D. So by five, since G is A mod E, so we know that E divides G minus A. And by the lemma that was, uh, you know, very similar to the Robinson lemma, G minus A divides YKG minus YKA. And by definition, this is equals to I minus D, right? YKG is I, YKA is uh, D. So combining these two together, E divides I minus D. So, so we're done for eight. Uh, now for nine, so nine was the inequality uh, that says that K is less than or equals to D. Well, it's easy to show that K is less than or equals to YKA, right? So just looking at the definition of D here, um, K is always less than or equals to YKA. That's a, a easy fact to show. So, so we kind of get that very easily. So, okay, so that was a mouthful. And uh, mostly I did this just to convince you that, okay, like this is, uh, 
you know, basically a lot of modular arithmetic and stuff. Of course, the definition of these uh, numbers here up here, right, is, is clever, right? But the actual verification is uh, pretty routine. So yeah, this proves one direction of the theorem. Uh, are there any questions about this direction before we do the other one? Okay, so now for the other direction. So what does that involve? Now we're gonna assume that we have uh, EFGHI, which satisfy the points one to nine. And then we must show that C is equals to XKA and D is equals to YKA. So here's the setup. Uh, so I've, uh, on the left is what we are assuming. We assume that there are EFGHI such that these, uh, all of these conditions hold. Now, uh, I'll need to define some auxiliary things, right? Uh, give some names to things because, well, right away, right? From equations one to three, we know that, well, all of these are Pell equations and we know exactly what solutions Pell equations have. So for example, based on the first equation, we know that C and D must be equals to XPA and YPA for some P. Similarly, E and F by equation two must be equals to XQA and YQA for some Q. And finally, by equation three, H and I must be XRG and YRG for some R. Okay, so this is something that we get from equations one to three. Now, how, how are these uh, four to nine useful? Well, that's gonna come up soon. Uh, but first of all, the, the main goal here, right? Remember, we wanted to show that C is equals to XKA and D is equals to YKA. So the main goal here is to show that K is equals to P. Okay, right, because C is XPA. So if K is equals to P, then that tells us that C is XK. Okay, how do we show that K is equals to P? Well, uh, let's reduce it further. So notice that um, P is less than or equals to YPA. That's again, basic property of the YP sequence, uh, which is equals to D by definition. And also K is less than or equals to D by the inequality number nine. So we have two numbers both of which are less than D. So as long as you can pin down their, their modular arithmetic with regards to D, uh, then, then we would be done. You know, then they must be equal if they agree mod D. Okay, so, so we're not actually gonna do quite that. We're gonna do something that's like quite similar. Uh, as long as we show that K is plus minus P mod 2D, then that's enough. Okay, but the idea is basically the same, right? Um, the, of course, the reason why we have this is because this is what the step down lemma is gonna give us. Um, so again, this is the key idea here is that if we know that two numbers are you know, kind of small, then it's in order to specify them uniquely, you just need to pin down their modular arithmetic with regards to a bigger number. Okay, so this here is the goal now. K is plus minus P mod 2D. Let's work towards that. All right, first, let's think about K mod 2D. Well, uh, seven tells us something about K mod 2D, right? Seven says that K is congruent to I mod 2D. Okay, so, so now we've, we have this. And then we also have I is actually congruent to R mod 2D. So remember R is chosen at the top here, right? So that H is XRG and I is YRG. Uh, so why is this true? Well, again, we're gonna do this uh, combination of uh, divisibility things. 2D divides G minus one, that's by six on the left. And G minus one uh, by Robinson's divisibility thing divides YRG minus R. And YRG is exactly I by definition. 
So that's I minus R. So we conclude that 2D divides I minus R. So I is congruent to R mod 2D. Okay, so combining these two congruences now, what remains is to show that R is plus minus P mod 2D. Okay, how do we show that? Uh, so I'm going to erase most of these slides, uh, but I will leave the kind of the key definitions as well as the goal. So here's the, again, the definitions of P, Q, and R, and this is the goal that we, we have to show, right? So once we show this, we complete the proof. Okay, now what? So I guess there are a few conditions we haven't used, so they're going to come into play soon. Uh, condition four, we haven't used, and here we can use it. So first we claim that D actually divides Q, okay? Uh, you know, not, not super obvious from, from the definition here, right? Uh, but it is true. Why is that? Well, because of four, we know 2D squared divides F, okay? And uh, by, well, so by definition, in particular, D squared divides F, which means that YPA squared divides YQA. So just using the definitions of uh, P and Q here. Now, if we have this, then the step down lemma one gives us that YPA divides Q. Well, what does this mean? Well, this is exactly D divides Q, right? D is equals to YPA. So this, uh, this reasoning here shows that D divides Q which means that uh, we can now reduce again to show that R is congruent to plus minus P mod two Q now. So we've changed the D here to a Q here, and we can do that because D divides Q. All right, now <laughs> let's see uh, what do we want to do here. Okay. Yeah, so, so a, few more, a few more technical calculations here. So by eight, we know that I is D mod E. Okay, so kind of just filling in what I, D, and E are, we get YRG is YPA mod XQA. And now by five, XQA, which is E, uh, divides G minus eight. Right, that's, that's exactly what five is saying, right? Five says E divides G minus A. And by the lemma that, uh, again, which was beside the Robinson one, G minus A divides YRG minus YRA. So the conclusion is that XQA divides YRG minus YRA. This is the um, combination now of these two here. Okay, so, so the, the thing here is that the thing that eight gives us, right, is a little weird because you have like a G here and you have A's here. Uh, that's not very pleasant. Uh, but with some extra work, we've managed to change the G to an A essentially. Uh, so with this now, now we are in a good form to apply the SDL2. And that gives us the conclusion we want that R is equals to plus minus P mod two Q. Okay, so, so this was the proof. And you know, I, I, I know that this was probably not enlightening in the slightest, but I just felt like, uh, you know, I, I felt like I had to kind of show you exactly, you know, like in a way how the sausage is made, right? So th this is how the sausage is made. Um, so in, in the future, I think, yeah, a lot of the proofs will not have this kind of gory detail. Um, but I think it's useful to see it at least once just to know that, okay, this is the kind of thing that goes on uh, behind, the, behind the scenes. So this here completes the proof of the theorem that the XKA and YKA sequences are Diophantine. And, and the thing on the left of the screen is what you see, this is the Diophantine definition of those sequences. Let's now uh, do a recap right, of what we've done. So we have just showed 
that the functions uh, taking a and k to x k a as well as the functions taking a and k to y k a are both diophantine. And by our previous discussion, uh, using Robinson's congruence, this implies that the exponential function is Delphantine. In turn, well, uh, that, that exponential function being Delphantine was an intermediate step in showing that the Delphantine relations are closed under bounded quantification. So that's the next goal that we are going to uh, strive towards. In order to do this, uh, we are going to talk about some other functions. We're going to show that they are diophantine. Uh, but now things are going to be sort of much more smooth going because the, the main sort of technical hurdle was the exponential function, right? Remember that was historically the last thing to be shown, right? But assuming that the exponential function is Delphantine, uh, we can sort of quickly show that a lot of other functions are Delphantine. So uh, in the next few slides, we'll talk about some other useful functions and uh, I'll, I'll briefly talk about why they are Delphantine uh, in much less gory detail. So it's clear that you know, I won't get to talk about all of these today. So let me end on this slide here. So I'll tell you what functions that we're going to work towards and, and we'll talk about the proofs uh, next time. So here's a theorem. Uh, we want to show that the following functions are Diophantine. The first one, uh, binomial coefficients. So we, we input n and k, we want to output n choose k. Okay, that's a... No, that, that we will show that that's a Delphantine function. The next function, second one in here, uh, the factorial function. Okay, you, you take in n, you map it to n factorial, that's Delphantine as well. Uh, finally, this last thing uh, looks a little weird. Um, and it is, you know, it's not a very natural thing to think about. It's like some kind of product of some kind of arithmetic uh, progression. And it, it will be useful in a technical sense in, in the later proof for the bounded quantification. Um, so let me just point out here that this last function, the third one, is actually a generalization of the factorial function. Because if in the, in the last function, you take t to be one, then a plus kt Oh, okay, so take, take t to be one and take a to be one as well. Then the product of a plus kt is just going to be the product of uh, essentially the numbers from one to y plus one, which is y plus one factorial. So, so this third one is a generalization of the second one, uh, but, but the reason why we have both here is because the second one is easier to prove and then we'll use that to kind of bootstrap to get the third one. Uh, on a similar note, you might also wonder uh, why like the binomial coefficient comes before factorial because, well, you, as you know, the binomial coefficient is easily defined from the factorial. Uh, but again, the point is that defining the binomial coefficient is easier, and then we will use that in our definition of the uh, factorial. So uh, next time we'll talk about uh, these functions in sequence. Uh, again, I promise that that will be short, <laughs> just uh, one slide each ish. Um, and then after that, we can sort of come back to recursion theory, right? Um, after all these number theoretic analysis, uh, now we can go back to recursive things and recursively enumerable things. I'll talk about unsolvability of Hubert's 10 problem for real. And I uh, oh, uh, hope to see you next time. All right. Uh, thank you, Junla. That was. Uh... A very interesting topic, and thanks for staying up late. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, happy to do that. Yeah, uh, thanks yeah. for thanks for the questions, and yeah. Yeah, any question for uh, Junla? Uh, is this? Uh, I mean, the proof that you gave are yeah. are they? You said that you're not following what 
was traditionally done. Um, did you did you do those proof yourself? I mean, no, no. What I mean is that uh, like there are several sources which give proofs, and uh -huh. I kind of cobbled together the proof from both sources. So it's not original, but it's just that like in the notation, I follow one source. Yep. And in some of the actual proofs, I follow another source. So, so it's not going to match up exactly. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, but, cool. but no, the ideas are all, um, none of them, are, none of them are mine. Yeah. 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 yeah it's a very interesting topic. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I mean, uh, yeah, yes. I, I definitely enjoyed preparing for this. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I learned a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks to Michael right. and, uh, Yin King. Yeah. Yep. So I guess uh, there is no question. So uh, thanks again. Um, I'll see you. When is when's the next? Um, uh, maybe next uh, Monday or something. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. And have good a, night. A, yes. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Bye, everyone.